Hi. So I thought today I'd give you a little overview of Highs. So we'll start with the website. So this is Highs.audio. Highs stands for Heart Instrument Sampling Engine. So Heart is Christoph Hart. He's the creator of Highs and the main developer. Instrument Sampler Engine, well, it's designed for making sample-based instruments, virtual instruments. But it can do so much more than that. It was originally only for sample-based instruments, but now you can make synthesizers, you can make effects plugins, you can make MIDI effects plugins, and you can make standalone applications. And there is a lot of detail to it, which I cannot go into in this video because there, it's just so much. But I will try and give you an overview and show you sort of the main points uh, just to whet your appetite. So this is the website, tells you a little bit about it. We've got a sampling workspace, scripting, modulators and effects. This website is actually a little bit out of date, but it will give you a sort of brief overview. And the documentation for highs is very good and very detailed. There's so much to it. So uh, reading through the documentation is definitely worth doing if you want to get involved with highs. And if you're ever struggling with highs, you can go to the highs forum. And there's a whole bunch of people here who will be ready to answer any of your questions. And because Highs is open source, if you discover a bug, or there's a feature you'd like, or you want to know more about Highs works, then you can just look through the source code, or if you're not a programmer yourself, you can get somebody else to look through it on your behalf. So unlike Contact, Highs is not a program for end users. So if you're making a Contact sample library, you build it inside Contact, and the end user runs it inside Contact. Highs isn't like that. Highs is a tool for developers to create plugins. So the end result from Highs is a VST or an AU plugin or a standalone application, and that's what you send to your users. So the users themselves don't need to know anything about Highs. They'll just get the end result. It's a bit like using a word processor to write a book. You don't need a word processor to read a book, but you'll use it to write a book. So this is the Highs source code on GitHub, and this is where you'll start your journey with Highs. So Highs is built with a framework called Juice, and Juice itself is a framework of C++ designed for making audio applications. So Highs is built with Juice, and Juice is a C++ framework. And if you're familiar with Juice, then anything you do with Juice, you can do with Highs. And if you want to bring Juice functionality into Highs that isn't already there, you can add that by editing the source code. Now to get Highs, you can actually go to the Highs website, and let's go there, and click download, and it says download the latest version, and if you click on that it takes you to this, but you can see this is 2018, this isn't the latest version, it's just the latest release version, and you shouldn't use this. Um, it's Highs is totally different from that version, so what you should do is go here, and download the source code from here and build it yourself. It's not complicated. Basically, if you're on Windows, you have to install Visual Studio. If you're on a Mac, you have to install Xcode. And if you're on GNU Linux, then you've probably got the tools you need, but you'll need GCC and a few other things. Everything you need um, is in here. So there's the instructions for it, for building it. You see here how to compile. So building highs isn't complicated. It takes maybe 10 minutes to do, but the first time you do it, and if it's the very first time you've ever compiled anything, there's going to be that learning curve and expect to spend a few hours on it and my tutorials will help you out. But there's two reasons you need to be able to compile Highs yourself rather than just using a pre-built downloadable version. The first reason is Highs is updated very frequently. If we go into here and I click this button, this is a list of all the updates and we can look at the dates. So what are we on today? It's March 15th today. And we can see February 24th, February 25th, February 28th, March 2nd, March 12th. So it's updated very regularly. So if you want to have all the latest features and latest bug fixes, you need to be able to build it yourself. The second reason is when you export your project from Highs, what Highs does is it generates a juice project. Remember I said Highs is built with juice. It generates a juice project that you then compile in the same way you build Highs. So if you can't build Highs, then you won't be able to export your project. So it's better to do this right at the beginning and get over that speed bump because it won't take you long. Once you've done it once, then it's plain sailing and build highs yourself from source and then you can export your projects. And you need to be able to export your own projects rather than getting someone else to do it because there are times when you need to debug things that you can only debug with an exported version. 
and it's annoying to have to go back and forth to an, another person to get them to export it for you. So just try and work through that and get the compiling working. And if you need any assistance with it, I will go through it with you one on one in a screen share call situation and we will get you up and running. So don't let that be your barrier to entry. We will get you past that and uh, it will work for you. OK, so that's kind of enough about the background of highs. Let's actually take a look at highs and I'll give you a little tour. So this is highs. This is kind of what it will look like the first time you open it. If you download that pre-built version from 2018, it won't look anything like this. But like I say, you shouldn't download that version anyway. So the interface is split up into different sections and you can see these little triangle buttons here. We can use these to close and open sections. So click that, click that. We can pop out these different parts and close parts and things. So it's quite versatile. I'm on a big wide screen here. This is an ultra wide monitor, but if you're on a smaller screen, you may find a vertical layout easier to use. So you can go to this view menu and click vertical layout. And th this may be a bit easier for you. Um, I sometimes go into a layout like this if I'm doing a lot of stuff with my GUI. And when you get more into highs, you can make totally custom layouts and like little floating tiles and things. So this is a, a custom layout I have, which I sometimes use. Um, so there's all sorts of customizations you can add to highs. OK, so on the left here, we have the module tree. This is where you'll actually build your project up. And we're going to look at this in more detail in a little while. So I won't go into this panel just yet. Then we've got the script editor. And I can zoom this in just by holding control and scrolling with my mouse wheel. And when you open a new file in highs, this is what it will look like in the script editor. So it will have this one line which says, make front interface 600 by 600 and that's referring to this here so that's the size of the ui so if i change that to 800 and hit this compile button here or press f5 it will change the interface here to 800 by 600 so we'll set that back to 600 by 600 hit f5 and this is where all your scripting takes place so i'm just going to write out a function and if you're not familiar with scripting, this won't make too much sense to you. But if you are familiar with scripting, hopefully this will make a lot of sense to you. So as I write my function, I also get an autocomplete. So I can scroll through here and find commands that I want. And then I can add in the parts that I want. And I can declare a variable here. This is actually an array. And I will call my function here. And I'll just hit F5 again. And this will give us enough for me to show you a few features of the code editor. So scripting in highs is really nice. The language is a very similar to JavaScript. It was initially based on JavaScript, but it pulls in elements from other languages as well. And it's a language all of its own. So don't try using your ECMA 6 JavaScript stuff in here. Uh, it's not going to work. You've got to learn Heise's own language. But if you are familiar with JavaScript, you will find it feels very familiar and it's uh, much easier to get into. We've got a mini map view here. So if I have a lot of code, and we'll see this in a minute when I open another project, uh, you can scroll up and down the mini map to, uh, to view your code more easily. We've got a list of functions here. So currently I've only got one function, my func, but if I had more functions, they would be listed here and we can jump to those by double clicking. And this list can be opened by pressing Control and R, which is used in a lot of other programs as well. We've got code folding. So if you want to hide bits of your code, you can do that. When we print out text, it appears in the console down here. And it's also printed in line in the code editor, which is really nice. We also have some debugging features like um, breakpoints. And we can also view our variables and see the contents of them and their data type. So I'll comment that out and hit F5 just to get rid of that text there. We'll clear out the console. Now over here on the right, let's, in fact, let's make it central. We have the interface designer. So this is where we can add controls. So we'll add a knob. We can add a button. We've got tables and slider packs. 
and waveform controls and panels and scroll boxes. We've got all kinds of things, but that's a good selection for now. And these are all controls that your user can interact with on the front interface. So what we're designing here is the front interface, the main interface that the user will see. We can have an interface preview if we click on this box here. This can sometimes be useful if you want to um, overlay the interface while you're looking at other screens. If we click this pencil icon here, this one there, and let's zoom this in as well. We can uh, move these controls around and change their size. And these graphics that we're seeing, uh, these are just the default graphics. You can style these using film strips like you can in Contact. You can also style them using code. You can actually draw them in code and they'll be drawn as vector graphics that will scale to any size. So that can be really useful, especially if you're planning on making an interface that looks good on both really big displays and really small displays. Over on the right here, when we click on a control, we get the property editor. So we can edit properties for this, uh, well, currently I've got this knob selected and you can see it's text is set to knob one. We can change that to, let's say volume. And if I open the code editor again and hit F5, we can see the name there changes to volume. Loads of other properties here, exposition, Y position, uh, colors, we can change those as well. Here we can set the minimum and the maximum values. Let's set the maximum to 127 there. This one here where it says use default skin, this is where you could load in a film strip if you wanted to, and you can tell it how many frames are in the film strip there. And there's loads of other settings we can choose from as well. If we go back to our scripting workspace and we'll click this button here, this shows a list of all our components. If we wanted to interact with this component, for example, in the script, we can write out some code to get a reference to this component. But actually from this list, we can just right click on the component and click here, create script variable definition, come over here and paste, and we get a reference to that control. So there is things in here that will help us out. Um, we don't have to write out every line of code if we don't want to. There's a, there's a lot of stuff to help us. So that's kind of a basic overview of the interface designer. There's a bit more to it, but that will do for now. Back over here to the left with the module tree. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just go through these three tabs. So the module tree will come to in a minute. The project directory, when you create a project in Highs, it creates a whole folder structure for you to store things like your presets and scripts and samples. And this project directory tab shows us the overview of that folder structure. We click on the API button, this one you'll be in all the time. This is the help guide for the scripting language. Pretty much all of the commands that you can use are here. There are a few extras that don't show up here, but most of them are here and they're categorized really nicely. So if you wanted to see the commands we could use with this um, knob here, they're actually under the script slider section. So if I type script slider in there, here's all the commands relating to this control. And if we want to know more detail about these commands, I'll zoom in a bit on this because you might not be able to see it on a small screen. If we want to know more details, we can right click and it will give us some information about how this command is used. Okay, let's go to the module tree now. This is where you actually build your project. So you'll spend a lot of time here. So if I click this edit button here, we can start adding and removing if we wanted to modules. So what we see here is like a tree view of our, our entire project. But if we click on one of these, we can get a sort of more detailed view. So this shows the same thing that's over here. We're just seeing it larger. So if I click these buttons here, you can see we've got this one MIDI is the same as this one over here. Gain is this gain modulation. That's this one over here. And effects is this effects over here. And these plus buttons are the same as these plus buttons. So this is just a different way of seeing the same thing over here. So I'll keep this open just for now so we can see it a bit more clearly. So MIDI processors, these are scripts basically. So this one is our main interface script, which is what we're viewing here. And I could select that from this drop down if we had other scripts. Highs is different contact in the scripting approach. In contact, you generally have one really big massive script. In highs, you can have lots of little scripts that do individual tasks. And this makes it much easier to write your program because you can compartmentalize things. And it also means if you want to use bits of code in another project, you can just copy a script across really easily. 
Your interface script will generally be your biggest and most complicated script, but you may have complicated secondary scripts as well. Uh, but you'll have one main interface script, and that's the one that the user will see. But you can add secondary scripts. Let's add one now, in fact. So we'll click script processor. And this gets its own interface, but the user will never see this. It's just something you can use internally while building your project. There are also some built-in scripts. Uh, we've got like a transposer, and in here we've got legato. That's not true legato. It's just a, like a synth legato. And um, an arpeggiator. So this is quite a useful module. And of course, you could build all of these yourself with scripting, but it's nice that we have them pre-built as well. In the gain section, we get gain modulation things. So this um, is things like LFOs or MIDI controllers, like for CCs. Now, we're currently in a container component here, which doesn't have many options. So you can see um, some of these are grayed out, but we'll see a few more options in a minute. And then effects is for adding effects. So we've got things like a filter, parametric EQ, reverbs, gain controllers. If I click on the filter, we can see that it has uh, these knobs for setting various parameters. And we've got these buttons here, and we can actually modulate these parameters so we can add additional modulators. So if I add an LFO, for example, to the frequency, you can see how that works. And the LFO itself can be further modulated. So we could even have an LFO modulating the LFO. And you can see how this goes, it can get quite complicated and you can do some really interesting and intricate uh, signal chains. So that's just a container. Um, it also has some standard controls like bypassing, volume control and uh, panning. So the container contains other modules. So this is the master chain, so that's the master container. You'll always have one of those. You can add secondary containers if you want to, to help break up your project. It's usually quite a good idea, and you can color code them as well. So that's quite nice. And then usually what you want to add, unless you're making an effects plugin, is you're going to want to add some kind of sound generator to the container. So we've got samplers, we've got sine wave generators, waveform generators, noise generators, wavetable synths, loop players, and a few other ones. Oh, we've also got this new one. I say new, depends on when you're watching this, but this has recently been added. It's a send container, and this is like a send bus for send effects. It's very useful. So we'll start with a sine wave generator. And now if I play on my keyboard, we're going to hear uh, sine waves. So that's a standard sine wave generator. Not too interesting, but you could pair these up, shift the octaves and the tuning and the gain, and build an additive synthesizer. So like the container, we can add scripts at the sound generator level. So we can add more scripts in here that will only apply to this sine wave generator. And we can modulate its gain. You can see by default, there's an envelope in there just with attack and release. But we could add things like a full AHDSR envelope, or we could add a table envelope if we wanted some more customization over the shape of the attack and release. And as you can see from these buttons, we can also modulate these parameters. We've got pitch modulation, so we can add things like a pitch wheel modulator. So if I now play keyboard and move my uh, pitch wheel. So a standard pitch controller. And of course, we can add effects as well. Same, same list of effects as before. Let's have a look now at the sampler. So I'm going to add it over here. But remember, this is, the, this is exactly the same view as this view. So I'll click here, add a sampler. And the sampler has the same set of things as we saw for the sine wave generator. We've got our scripts, our gain modulation, our pitch modulation, our effects. We can also adjust the sample start, we can modulate that, and we can adjust crossfading if we want to crossfade between dynamic layers, for example. If we click on body, we can see a mapping editor, and we also get that over here in the right hand side. And if we click sampler settings, we get a few additional settings we can uh, tweak, like the number of round robin groups, and uh, things like is it uh, reversed, is it one shot, that kind of stuff. If we open the sample editor, we get this same view that we've got on the right. 
and this table view, we also have that over here on the right as well. So let's look at this big version on the right instead of looking at it in here. So this is a standard mapping window that you might be familiar with from Contact. So you can think of a sampler in high as like an entire instance of Contact. And the only real difference is if I had some groups here, let's say I had 10 groups. So these are different groups. So in Contact you have groups and each group can have its own set of modulators and uh, effects and things like that. In highs, you can't do that, at least not currently. Uh, groups are just used for storing samples and separating them. So you, by default they use for round robins, so you'd have different repetition samples in each group, but you can use them for dynamic layers, you can use them to separate articulations, you can use them to separate instruments, whatever you want to use them for, they're there to be used to separate samples. If you do want to apply different effects or modulators to a different set of samples, then all you have to do is add another sampler. So instead of having multiple groups, you'd have multiple samplers. But try and use samplers sparingly because they're quite uh, CPU heavy. I mean, they're not crazy heavy, but the more samplers you add, the more CPU you're going to use. So try and keep the number of samplers to a minimum. So whereas in contact, you might have uh, hundreds of groups, you don't want to have hundreds of samplers. If you're really familiar with contact, you're going to have to switch your brain around a bit and um, get familiar with the way highs works. Don't try and impart your contact way of working onto highs because you're going to end up being disappointed. You've got to find a new way to do things in highs. So I'll drag some samples in just so you can see how the mapping works. So I've just got some flute samples here. Uh, so you can see this says flute one underscore sustain underscore large omni. So that's the uh, microphone underscore underscore 70 and then this one's underscore 71. So the, the numbers in these names refer to the MIDI note number. So if I just drag a selection of these out, and we'll drag them on there, and we can map them in a number of ways using auto mapping. So I'm going to click the file name token parser, and this is going to split up the file name based on underscores. And there's that note number here, 60, set to single key, note number, and, um, and we can see all the others set to ignore. So when I click OK, it's going to map the samples to those keys. And it looks like I had a gap in there, so we can fill that in by clicking that button. So this is the mapping window. You can also import SFZ mapping. So if you've got an SFZ file, you can click this button, select that file, and it will import the sample mapping from that file. But it doesn't import opcodes. It's not an SFZ to highs converter. It just imports the mapping. We can select samples by clicking and dragging, or we can just click one. We can also use the keyboard to uh, select samples. So it's very versatile. Over on the right hand side, we've got a table view, which just gives us a list of all the samples and we can filter it here. So if I just wanted samples with 62 in the name, I could type 62 and hit enter and it would select all the samples with 62 in the name. In this case, there's only one of those. If I click on a sample, we get this wave editor and you can see that the sample isn't quite trimmed. You can see we've got like a gap there. So we can trim the sample by clicking to adjust the start position or right clicking to adjust the end position. And there's also an auto trimmer. So if you notice, none of these samples are trimmed perfectly. So if we select them all, right click, tools, trim sample start, and we just adjust a few of these parameters. I think I've got another tutorial that goes into detail about how to use this. So I'll just um, do this quickly. So I'll hit OK, hit OK again, and it's trimmed the sample start and end. And it's done that for all these samples. And we could fine tune that some more, but basically it saves you a lot of time because it means you don't have to cut the samples as accurately before you bring them into highs. You can use highs to tidy them up for you. If we hold control, we can click and hear some playback from the sample. So we can audition the sample. If we zoom right in and we want to move around, we've got this mini map up here so we can search around our sample. We can see a spectrum view of the sample there. Or if we put it off halfway, we can see both the waveform and the spectrum. Really useful for if you're trying to uh, trim a sample for making release triggers. So there we go. So that would be a nice release trigger there. One of my favorite new features that's been added, or a recent feature, is a gain 
and pitch envelope. So we can adjust the gain of the sample. And we can also adjust the pitch, which is great if the sample has uh, problems where it drifts slightly out of pitch. Also, if we click this tick button here, it will apply an auto tuning. So it will try and uh, make the pitch even across the whole duration. We have looping, we can add loop points. So standard sort of thing, and you can add a crossfade. We can also fine tune the loop in here. And if we click this button here, it will try and auto smooth the loop. It will try and find better loop points. So there we go. And if I click to play back this. It's a pretty smooth loop we've created there. And you can interact with this mapping editor through scripting. So you can copy loop points between uh, dynamic layers and things uh, really quickly without having to do it manually. You can just set up a script that will batch process all of your samples. So it can be really powerful to uh, interact with this through the scripting editor. Now, once you've mapped all your samples, you can convert them to a monolith, which is like a compressed format. Uh, it's about 50% compression, depending on the samples you're using. Sometimes it can be more, sometimes it's a bit less. This is comparable to Contact's compression format, and it saves disk space and saves on RAM, so it's a good idea to do that. And once you've finished mapping, you can save your mapping as a sample map. So unlike Contact, where once you've mapped your samples into the group, they're kind of trapped in there, with highs, they're saved as a separate sample map, which is actually an XML file, and that's saved in your project folder. So if I go to my project directory and click this button, Sample Maps, here's a list of all my sample maps, and you can see they're XML. And if I double click, we can actually see the XML that's contained in there. So it's just got details of all the samples. But you can edit this in a text editor. So if there's ever a bug or you want to batch edit things, you can do this in a text editor. You don't have to do it inside highs, which is great. And you can swap them between different projects and samplers really easily. So let's open up one of my sample maps. Uh, so I've got a clarinet sustain here. So this is one that I made earlier. And this, you can see it says over here, monolith. That's because I've compressed it. So these are no longer WAV files. They're compressed into a monolith. Although the WAV files are still on my hard drive. It doesn't delete them. It just, um, it just references the monolith instead of the WAV files. And you can see I've set these up with loops and this green section is a bit of sample start offset. Now these are multi-mic samples and Highs manages multi-mic samples beautifully. In contact, if you want multi-mic samples, you basically have to layer different samples into different groups and keep track of them yourself, make sure they're in sync and they're all lined up and whatnot. In Highs, you don't have to do that. Uh, I've got another video on this, but basically you drag in all your samples for all the different mic positions and it will merge them into a pseudo single sample called a multi-mic sample. So when you're working in highs, you only have to treat it like there's one sample here, but in actual fact, all the samples are there. And if we go up here, we can select the different mic positions. So you can see this is a close mic. It's just uh, mono. You can see in the mini map there. If I click this one, it's Decca and it's stereo. We can see the mini map is now showing a stereo signal. And we've got surround and we've got wide mics as well. And back to the close mic. So all I have to do is make my changes to the close mic and they'll automatically be applied to the other mic positions as well. So for example, I can loop the close mic and those loop points will apply to all the other mic positions. And it just works really beautifully. And of course you can purge those independently. If we open up our sampler, we can go to here and we can purge individual channels. So it's not like you're using a multi-channel wave file where all the data is in one file. The data is still in separate files, but Highs is just treating it like a single file for our convenience. Another thing we have is the routing matrix where we can decide which input channels go to which output channel. In this case, I've only got two output channels, so everything's going to stereo, but if I had more, I could direct it to other channels as well. So this is great for making multi-channel plugins, like if you've got a drum sampler and you want to have different drums going to different outputs and things like that. So I said you can use groups for dynamics, and in this case, that's exactly how I'm using them. So I've got three groups here. These little dots, by the way, allow us to select different groups. We can also right click to select a group, or we can view all groups at once. And 
these groups are, have got different dynamic layers. So this first group, uh, let's see, where does it say the sample name? Somewhere up here. So this is dynamic one. So that's like my piano dynamics. Then this one would be uh, dynamic two. So it's like mezzo forte. And then this one is dynamic three, which is like fortissimo. And I've mapped these to different groups. And if I click on my sampler and I choose this drop down here, group XF and set it to enabled. And now it says here, fade on. Also says it over here. If I click that, I can choose a crossfade for my three groups. So let's just open these all the way. And if I add a gain modulator, this is going to get a bit complicated, but bear with me. So I'm just going to increase the ADSR. Let's add a gain modulator for uh, my mod wheel, so MIDI CC1. And we'll also add a gain modulator to this one, group fade, which I mentioned earlier. We'll add, um, sorry, a CC modulator to here. And now if I move my mod wheel and play a note, you'll see a line in here showing my mod wheel and you'll hear the dynamic level changing as it crossfades through the samples at the same time as uh, controlling the gain modulation. So a really fast way to create dynamic crossfades and it's all built in. You'll notice I haven't done any scripting here. I've just selected built in um, functionality. So this is another reason why you really should um, try and disconnect yourself from contact if you're familiar with that environment and try and do things the highs way because there's so many shortcuts that you'd um, be missing out on if you were trying to force it to work the way contact works. And it will take getting used to. Like I've been using it for five or six years now and I'm really familiar with it, but it, it will take time. Okay, so one last thing I want to show you is with the effects, if we go in here, we'll add, um, so we've got all these built-in effects like filters, uh, parametric EQ, uh, reverb, gain control, convolution reverb, limiter, chorus, etc. We've got all these standard effects, but sometimes, especially if you're making an effects plugin, you want to use something different or you want a different uh, DSP algorithm or something like that. So what you should use is the script effects. So if I click that, it's going to take us to a new workspace. And this is a script node workspace. And in the script node workspace, we can build DSP networks using nodes and cables to connect things together. So it's a visual programming environment for DSP prototyping. So if I select one of my uh, existing networks, so let's see, try to remember what I've created. Let's have a look at this one. Okay, so this is a crazy LFO thing I created. And you can see the kind of stuff you can put together. So this is great for people who like things like Max MSP or Super Collider or Pure Data, all those kind of node-based or graph-based DSP construction toolkits. And there's a whole load of nodes. I'm not going to go into any details with this, and I'm by no means an expert on script node. I haven't used it much myself, but I've made a few little projects like this with it. Um, you can add controls like I have here, which are sort of master controls, which control my other modules throughout here. And these can be accessible on your main interface script. So you could link your interface up to these controls so the user can interact with your custom effects. So I know a lot of you out there will probably be really into this. And it's quite a new feature in Hive. Like it's been in development for a couple of years, but it's only just sort of really matured. There are a few commercial plugins out there using this, and I'm using this currently in a soon to be released commercial project. Now this is script node. So as well as the nodes, we also have access to scripting. So you can interact with all of this stuff on the right-hand side using scripting uh, in the uh, left-hand side. And if we wanted to add new nodes, we can click here, for example, and there's a whole load of nodes to choose from. And if you know C++, you can make your own custom nodes as well and import those into highs. Any script node networks you create in one project, you can use in another project or share with other users as well. Oh, and that brings me to one great feature of highs. If we go back to our main interface script, if you are collaborating with other people or you want to share an example that you've made with other people, you can go to this export menu and select export as high snippet. And it will copy a code to your clipboard and you can paste it in the forum for example here's a here's what it'll look like it's just a long string like this but you could 
paste this in the forum. And if I open a, a blank instance of highs, we can go to file, import snippet, and it's going to import exactly what we had in that project, including the script node graph. So this is really useful for communicating with other people and sharing um, data with them. A couple more little things uh, for the scripters out there, if you're familiar with contact scripting, you've got your standard callbacks on init, on note, on note off, on controller. Then we also have a timer callback, an on control callback, and we've got a few other callbacks that you can access through scripting. But basically, if you're familiar with contacts callback system, Heise's callback system, at least the, at the basic level, is very similar. When you're exporting your project from Heise, and remember, you have to be able to compile Heise in order to be able to export from Heise, because Heise isn't really doing any exporting, it's building a juice project that will be compiled for you by your compiler. But you go to the export menu, and you can see we've got export as VST or AU plugin, export as an FX plugin, export as a MIDI FX, and export as a standalone application. If we open the highest preferences, we also have the choice to export as a VST3. And you probably want to use VST3 because uh, Steinberg is pretty much discontinuing VST2, and you can't sign up for a VST2 license if you don't already have one anywhere. So one last thing I'm going to show you, I'm just going to open up a project I'm working on. So I released the library a couple of years ago called Sophia Woodwinds, and this is kind of my uh, redone version. It's still in the process of being made, uh, but we've got a nice preset browser. Uh, so this is a, a real project, and you can see this is my module tree here. Let's just have a look in there. Oop, no, I didn't want to open that one. Uh, there we go. So. You can see the module trees can grow quite large. I've got uh, one, two, four, four samplers in here and a bunch of scripts and some effects and uh, send bus. So there's quite a lot to it. And then in my scripts, I've got, these are all separate files. So you can include separate script files to make one larger script. So these are all mini scripts. And then if I, let's, let's open one of these scripts actually. Let's open, this configuration script. And now in the minimap preview, you can see that how the minimap works. You can drag up and down in here and quickly go through different parts of your script. And if you right click, you can select uh, to enable a hover preview. So when you hover your mouse over, you can actually see a little preview of which bit of code you're looking at. So it can make it really quick to navigate around your project. Oh, and you can make this wider as well if you want, but I, I like it thin. As I was saying before, you don't have to use uh, film strips to style your user interface. You can do this all through scripting, and this interface you're looking at here, there is not a single image here. All of this is done through scripting, these uh, knob graphics and these sliders, and uh, the little uh, VU meter, these VU meters here, uh, all done through scripting. There are, there are no image files in this whatsoever. So I hope you found this interesting. I hope it's whet your appetite a bit for learning some more about highs. It's a beast of a program. There is so much to it, and I've only just scratched the surface with this. And I know I've been going fast, but I wanted to show off as much as I could in this uh, video. But if there's anything else you want to know about, leave it in the comments below. If you'd like to get detailed monthly highs tutorials, go and check out my Patreon page, link in the video description. I'm genuine when I say I will go one-on-one -on -one with you and help you build highs if you are struggling with it, but give it a go yourself first. I've helped a few people out like that and uh, it seems to really benefit them and we get past a bunch of the difficult stuff at the very beginning. And if there's a whole group of you that wants to do that, maybe we could organise a workshop or something and uh, get several of you up and running in, in one go. If you're having any trouble with highs, go and ask on the highs forum, it is the best place to ask. And I'm there regularly, like every day I'll check in, and there's a whole bunch of other people who are there who know more than me about lots of stuff to do with highs. So it's definitely worth asking on the forum. Oh, one final thing I should mention, highs is released under the GNU GPL license. And if you release your software under the GNU GPL license, then you don't have to pay either Juice or Christoph for a highs license. You don't need to pay anything and you can make commercial products that are released under the GNU GPL. As long as you're following the rules of the GNU GPL, it's fine. If you want to release under a different license, then you will need to buy both a Juice license and a Highs license. And the pricing on those varies, so you'd need to check out the Juice website and talk to Christoph about pricing.
So this has been a long video, hope you found it interesting and hopefully helpful and inspiring. I hope it makes you want to go and check out Highs because it's a really good bit of software and I think it's the future of audio plugins, uh, especially sample libraries and virtual instruments in general. So that's all I've got for you today, thank you very much for watching and until next time, bye for now.